In today's news, Education Minister says that schools will reopen in September, subject to the approval of Cabinet. Residents react to government's decision to lock out non-locals and Dr. The Honorable Natalia Whitley officially appointed to serve as the Territories and Deputy Premier. All this and more when 284 News returns. There's a reason you get up on a morning. A reason you pick yourself up. Start the day. Maybe it's sheer grit. Maybe it's your ethics. Maybe it's because you know people like you are waiting. For people just like you. We all have our reasons. And for Republic Bank, that reason is you. Every little thing. Every big thing. It's all about making a difference in your life. Because after 182 years, if it's one thing we're sure about, is that the difference is you. We're here to help. Republic Bank, we're the one for you. Welcome everybody. It's Friday, August 7th, 2020. Another fantastic day in nature's little secrets out of the beautiful British Virgin Islands. I'm Ron Grant. And I am Javon Wilson. So thrilled to be joining you for another edition of 284 News. Now, Ron, while most of this week we had some holidays, it's yes. still been a pretty long week as it relates to what's happening, not just in the British Virgin Islands, but across the territory and across the world. And definitely lots to get into, beginning with our education system. Now, viewers, coming out of our exclusive interview with the Minister of Education, Dr. The Honorable Natalia Whitley, it was confirmed yesterday that school is set to be reopened on September 21st, subject to the approval by cabinet. Let's watch. All right, so the government of the Virgin Islands uh, recently made a decision uh, to keep schools closed until October 31st of this year. Initially, we heard schools were reopening um, just around September. What would have happened between those two announcements that would have caused government to postpone the physical reopening of school? Uh, thank you for allowing me to provide some clarity. Uh, there's been some confusion uh, based on uh, the announcement that has been made, and I'm, I'm happy to be able to clear it up for persons. Uh, firstly, government has not made a decision uh, to keep schools closed until October uh, 31st. Okay. What has happened is that the Minister of Health and Social Development under his powers uh, can issue a suppression and control order. And this is the order that originally closed schools somewhere back in March. Now these orders are done for three months at a time. So we did one in March and then um, coming towards the end of July, uh, we had to do another order. And the order basically continues on the last decisions, which were decisions made in cabinet. Now, uh, when cabinet makes a decision on schools, which cabinet will be making a decision on, on schools shortly, the order will be amended to reflect the decision of cabinet. So all that has happened with this order is that it continues for another three months the last set of decisions that cabinet has made in relation to schools. So cabinet uh, back in March uh, decided that schools would remain closed until cabinet makes a, a decision to do otherwise. So that's reflected in this particular order. Now, viewers, I know that brought some much-needed clarity as it relates to the date specifically that the suppression order was issued, which hi highlights, Ron, currently uh, that date being October 31st. Now, the education minister, we hear him saying now that it was a health order issued by the Minister of Health, but not necessarily a decision made by the government of the Virgin Islands, which really brings into question a couple of things. We have to look at communication, 
who's running the ship and by what principles are these decisions being guided by. But nevertheless, a great point of clarity because many people are still very confused, not just about the decision to have schools uh, remain closed up until that time, but also the reasoning behind it. And those reasons are not necessarily being communicated with the public, Ron. Jovan, one of the things that were evident in the minister's statement yesterday was definitely the disparity in dates. Now, initially, as we said, the Minister of Health, Honorable Carvin Malone, stated that the reopening date for schools will be October 31st. However, we see where the Honorable Minister of Education and Culture stated yesterday schools will be reopened on September 31st, 2020. Now, there are a few things about this that need to be looked at with, I think, close consideration. Firstly and foremost, while errors are inevitable, uh, when it comes to the government business and cabinet decisions, I find it rather uh, substandard that one minister, namely the Honorable uh, Malone, who is not responsible for education, will make such a statement. Secondly, if cabinet its approval makes all decisions, how is the education minister, who is a member of cabinet, not privy to what the Honorable Minister of right. Health would have stated in the cabinet order? Mm -hmm. Now, in his remarks, Honorable Wheatley stated that it was an oversight in the cabinet's decision to not mention that summer programs and other extracurricular activities are still allowed to operate and more than uh, likely to really clarify the dates as it pertains to school. To be honest, I mean, really minister an oversight, more of a lack of communication, I think, between cabinet members. That's, that's what is being uh, highlighted. Definitely, Ron. I, I do agree with you. I think communication seems to be a pressing issue, and the public is left in a very uncomfortable position uh, yes. because of it. But viewers, further on in that interview, we also saw the minister announcing that plans are also in motion to support both online school as well as in-school learning come the new school term. Let's watch. And I have to tell the public that a plan has been constructed by officials in the Ministry of Education. The plan has been circulated to all stakeholders, including um, schools. And all the schools would be fully aware that we've circulated this plan in terms of how school would look come September 21st, subject to the approval of Cabinet. And we are basically proposing a blended system of online learning and face-to-face -face instruction. Uh, we will not be able to accommodate all the students in school because of social distancing. And we certainly will be observing social distancing in the new school year. Okay. And for the bigger schools, they certainly won't be able to accommodate all the students at the same time. So we're proposing somewhat of a shift system where some students would be in school and some students would be at home. And then, of course, those who are at home will have an opportunity to be at school at some point. And the education officials have, I believe, done a good job of proposing a system that blends both. In a situation okay. where uh, schools are big enough and they have small enough student populations to be able to accommodate all the students, uh, then all the students would be able to attend without having to resort to the shift system. That was the Honorable Dr. Natalia Whitley. Now, while it's still not a perfect situation, Aaron, and of course subject to changes by, I agree. Uh, of course, Cabinet and the Environmental Health uh, Facility, I think this, re this decision really brings a lot of relief to um, a lot of households. Persons are currently strained. Um, we cannot be shy about that. To find a balance, or in some cases, having to choose mm -hmm. between either holding their jobs or staying home with their children. So again, we see the minister proposing a shift system. Again, viewers, not approved as yet, still has to get cabinet, uh, stamp, cabinet's stamp on it, um, and again, must be approved by environmental health and the relevant uh, authorities leading the charge for coronavirus in the territory. But uh, once all goes well, I think our students will be able to return to an environment that is um, conducive for learning in a safe and managed approach. Jovan, what, are, what, are, what I find very interesting, what if we didn't conduct the interview with the Honorable Minister of Education himself yesterday? Yep. Would the people of the Virgin Islands, parents, teachers, students, and businesses not have clarity as it pertains to the most accurate dates of the reopening of schools and whether or not Bad private point. facilities would even be allowed to open? I think these decisions not only affect parents and students, they affect the business community as well. Once the Minister of Health made his statement and released the saying there was no clarity whatsoever on schools and the school-related businesses. As a matter of fact, these statements were made and that was it. No allowances or clarity or 
uh, options for question and answer. However, in the interview conducted with uh, Minister Wheatley yesterday, Jovan, all of the sudden, all of a sudden residents now have clarity and we're thankful for that clarity. But I, I think what's important is that the government of the Virgin Islands cannot continue to keep residents in limbo on pertinent issues. If you don't know, say you don't know. And additionally, stop waiting until the media particularly challenges to then state your position and state what your intentions are. Understand, and I think this is very important, we are yes. playing with people's lives. Right. We are juggling with their lives and our, the future of our generation. We cannot afford to do that. The government um, in, in instance, perhaps maybe dropping the ball, and we cannot afford to do that. Summer programs, uniform purchases, book purchases, all of these are matters that affect parents and businesses, and each of these stakeholders need to be prepared. And if the cabinet is not prepared or the same or on the same page, I think, uh, and pushing the same agenda, then obviously I think, to be honest with you, BVI, we have, uh, we have a problem. Uh, Ron, there's so much we can go around as it relates to these topics. Uh, but like you yes. said, we're very glad for the clarity, and we're happy to move forward. So parents... Do not lose hope. September 21st is the day to look for. We're excited and looking forward to that as well. Indeed. Still ahead, the public continues to react to government's sudden decision to lock out non-locals. And trust me, you, you'd be surprised at the various levels of opinions on this. Now, we're breaking it down here at 284 Media. All this and more after word from our sponsors. Stick and stay. Is business slow? Cash flow down? Hosting an upcoming event? We can help. Advertise with 284 Media and take your business or event to the next level by enhancing your present marketing and messaging strategies. Allow our team of experts to create a personalized ad that sets your business apart from all the rest. This could be your business or event. So, what are you waiting for? Contact our marketing team at 284 Media at cctbvi.com. Advertising with us works. Viewers, welcome back to 284 News. Now, following the onset of the novel coronavirus pandemic and forced closure of the borders, many decisions were left to be made by the government of the day regarding living relations as well as the population of the BVI. Now, more recently, the government made a bold decision to refuse persons with work permits and exemption status back into the BVI. Now, as you can imagine, the statement did not come without backlash, as the economy of the BVI rests on 70% of the population being expatriates. Now, Vera's leader of the opposition, Honorable Marlon Penn, has since slammed the government, calling this a knee-jerk decision. He said, quote, this decision lacks clarity and therefore it creates an uneasiness and uncertainty for families and the business community concerning its labor force. A decision with such far-reaching implications should never be a blanket decision. Such a decision requires consultation and probably should allow for discretion on a case-by-case -case basis and in conjunction with local businesses, end of quote. Now, Ron, this decision by no means was an easy pill to swallow for a lot of, of people, as you can imagine, and, we, and we've seen uh, the backlash, like we mentioned. When you break it down, um, not only the, the population of the BVI, but the makeup as well, when you examine the many contributions and how intricately the expatriate community has managed to not just adapt to the principles and commit to the betterment of the BVI, and also when you hang a microscope over the, the very fact and I say fat here because in order for us to qualify for an exemption, I say us because I represent that expatriate community, you must be in the British Virgin Islands for at least 20 years uh, and would have committed 20 years of your life to the community um, only to be locked out. Hmm. You know, when we speak of the expatriate community, Ron, um, we speak uh, you know, to it as if they only populate the tourism industry, uh, completely neglecting the fact that they are teachers, they are doctors, they are entrepreneurs. Um, when you look across a territory, we cannot deny that expatriates too have led the way. When we look at the boating industry, yes, the medical industry, the Vantapools, they're Anguillans. You know, we look at the telephone and insurance companies that are run by Guyanese, Rightways run by British citizens, VI Airlink, Bajan, uh, One Mart, Anguillan. Uh, we have our leading restaurants, um, and that, that essentially makes up the tourism industry that are, that are run by non-locals. Even some of our politicians, Ron, who stood in representation of the people's needs. There are Cubans, uh, uh, they have Cuban heritage. Our former first lady has Angolan heritage. Pussers, Hunt and Co. There's so many businesses and so many representations hmm. to go around. 
And like I said, these are the physical representations of people who came to the BVI and clasped hands with BVI landers to push for the autonomy Indeed. of the foods that you and I are now able to enjoy. And I think we cannot deny that 70% of these people are considered expatriates and members of that community. So it makes me question why we are so quick to dehumanize and, and, and by the, the very explanation of the word chastise some of the very people upon whose backs the economy was strengthened and maintained. Uh, Jovan, very interesting point, and I appreciate your candid, uh, candid thoughts. A few things to consider. I find it very interesting that uh, discrimination in our Constitution is crystal clear, crystal clear. Uh, yet we do not adhere to the Constitution on all aspects. This ban is clearly a discrimination in line with the VI Constitution. Now, we would remember recently uh, the word discrimination was used by a minister of uh, uh, our counsel, the Honorable Mark Vantable, as it pertains to uh, the uh, persons being born here but not able to vote. However, that's just an example, but however, um, I think when we think of this, uh, we have to look at both aspects, and one of the aspects that I consider in times of crisis, while many are in favor of the, are not in favor of the government's decision, we have to understand that in any country, any country will put their people first, as they should. Fair any enough. parent will tell you they will feed their child or their children first before giving their last bit of food away to someone else's child. Now, this is no different. I think it's a prime example. And I do believe that instead of making it an expat versus local conversation, there needs to be an understanding that Virgin Islanders should and will always come first and be looked after at all costs. Now, let's take the repatriation of nationals back to the Virgin Islands, for example. I think that's a good example. While many of the individuals who are rep repatriating back to the BVI may be students, many of them are also seasoned professionals who are now out of work because of the global pandemic that is COVID-19, wherever they were before. So if they are coming back home by the hundreds, which they are, and we are not making space for them, what will they be coming home to? Understood. Where will they work? How will our people now make a living? Now, these are all important aspects that need to be uh, taken into consideration. I do agree that the abrupt nature of the announcement will leave many persons in limbo, and that is what I do not agree with. We seem to go to sleep and wake up in the BVI to a myriad of decisions and legislations to, by the BVI government that are passed while we're sleeping with no warning and no room for preparation. That is what I do not agree with because at the end of the day, again, we are playing with people's lives. A very important aspect to look at as well, Jovan, is the lack of revenue that the BVI government will now be not receiving through the work permit applications and, and so on. And this decision not only leaves many in limbo, but it now cuts out an entire chunk of the BVI's revenue. Can the BVI government confidently state that our economy uh, will not be further impacted by this decision? I think. Um, it's very important to look at that financial aspect and the ramifications that mm -hmm. putting those persons, that you're not putting those persons in, will now have on the BVI economy. Now, many persons have joined in this conversation. Another yes. prominent businessman and former education minister, uh, Myron Wallen, has again shared his concern in a rec on the recent issues in a response to the leader of the opposition's comments. In a recent Facebook post, Wallen said, and I quote, great points raised by the leader of the opposition. This policy, also quite possibly contravenes Article 3 of the Human Rights Act 1998, portions of which is replicated in the human rights chapter of our Constitution. This policy is tantamount, inhumane, and degrading treatment. He first said, to qualify for a work permit exemption, generally you have to be living in the BVI for 20 uh, continuous years. Mm -hmm. There are no exceptions. Now, how do you tell someone who happened to be out of the territory at the time of lockdown that they cannot return to where they have lived for at least the past 20 years. Many of these persons may not have any real ties with their place of birth after leaving for so many years. Their whole life is right here in the BVI. What are we saying? And he continued by saying, what about persons who have their family, wife, husband, or children here in the territory and they cannot return to care for them? There are so many different cases that come to mind. How do you arrive at these policy Positions. I understand that there are difficult times, but our policies must be still based on the principle of dignity, the innate value of all human beings. What message are we sending uh, about our territory? Jovan, um, I think this uh, statement by former legislator Myron V. Walwyn uh, echoes a lot of sentiments to what we uh, similarly discussed. And again, we're not taking a position, but what I, what I want persons to understand, there are different aspects that need to be looked at as, as you think and consider uh, this very important issue. Uh, people, like uh, the former minister said, are 
their families are here, their husbands and their uh, wives are here. How do you just all of a sudden uh, lock someone out? I think what the government of the Virgin Islands perhaps needs to look at is their way of convening these messages. Um, you often heard this saying, it's not what you say, but how you say it. And it's also not what you do, but how you do it. And I think in this abrupt manner, without giving persons an opportunity to be prepared, if you had said to me, if you had said to the territory and the people, perhaps any, we will not be issuing any new exemptions or work permits moving forward, Mm. Perhaps we could understand that because right. we're in a very tickler situation. But for you to just abruptly, out of nowhere, we wake up one morning and um, persons are not allowed to come in. I think that's what's daunting. Um, and inhumane treatment is essentially um, is what we're seeing. But on the flip side, you can see where because we're in a pandemic, uh, countries are now looking for creative ways to protect their locals and protect their residents. But I really think it's our approach. I agree with you fully, Ron, and I think that's where we need to join heads and come together as opposed to being divisive. Because what you find is these decisions are not just guiding uh, persons on both sides of the spectrum, but it's further dividing them because now you put the people in a position to fight each other. Exactly. Um, and I think a lot of valid points coming out of uh, former educator, um, legislator, sorry, uh, Myron Walwin, and a lot of thought-provoking, not just statements, but questions to be answered uh, before we are to consider decisions that will affect not just the lives, but the livelihoods of people. And like you said, Ron, with the permit fees uh, being absent, have we really considered, and not Indeed. just the permit fees, but many of our industries, the construction industry, the finance industry, the tourism industry, so many persons across the territory are employed with in those industries, have we really considered the economic ramifications of forcing people out who support the economy? Um, and and my, my issue with this is I find that we are so quick to shut down and apply a blanket approach to a multi-dimensional issue. Correct. You know, Correct. Immigration reform is something we've been speaking about for a very long time, and it was never addressed. But you cannot legalize, or sorry, um, you cannot give people, you, can, you cannot give 1,500 status and then say you're not allowed in. Like, what message are you sending? Jovan, and I'm, I'm, so, I'm, yes. I'm so happy that you brought up the, the status because recently, as Virgin Islanders, we would all remember uh, the present administration one of the uh, first things they did once they got in was to grant status to uh, many persons who were living and working um, in the Virgin Islands for a length of time. What are you now saying to those persons? Because I'm sure if we check the records, um, if the government checks the records of how many persons that were granted status and that are now outside, uh, perhaps caught outside, now they have the status, but what are you saying to others who may be interested in um, getting those same benefits, whether residents or belongers? You're saying to them that if they perhaps don't get that they're not worthy. I think we're sending mixed messages. We are, and what I'm concerned about equally is the moral degradation, because mm. we cannot heal this divide that we're speaking about, Ron, and we cannot deny that it's there. It is there by enforcing and embracing decisions that causes further confusion in our communities. Additionally, Ron, on yesterday, the Minister of Education announced that physical school will convene in September, September 21st. Um, do you know that some of the very teachers that teach our students are currently locked out uh, because of point. this decision? Yeah. So in closing, viewers, I just want to remind all of us of a fact shared by a fellow journalist just last night on social media. And the, the, the journalist said this, and I'm going to quote him, okay? He said... Many forget this country's history of dependence on Cuba, the cane factory in San Pedro and Santo Domingo and St. Thomas for its earlier survival. If you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat numerous mistakes. This is nothing but discrimination. Now then, Ron, how can you acknowledge that as your humble beginnings but discriminate against a majority in the community that has come under the same reasons to build mm. a life and a community. As a territory, I think we need to apply more empathy, more logic, and more reasoning and stop playing chess with people's lives simply because of, of where we come from. And you know, I think it's all guided by the mosaic law and we all talk about this we repeat this it's an adage that we go back to time and time again because it's one of the guiding principles in life and it says do unto others as you would have them do unto you especially now that we are in a pandemic 
very interesting points, Jovan. I think uh, there is much to consider, and we'll continue to follow this story. Yes. I think what a person sometimes forget is um, decisions and, and, and laws that are put in place and, and, and measures such as this have a very rippling effect, a domino effect. And one of the things that we've been working very hard um, I, I don't know if everyone has been working hard enough on it, but many persons have been doing their part in merging and 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 uh, cutting that gap of expats versus locals. And I think when we make decisions like this, we're deepening that 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 gap. That even though the conversation really shouldn't be about that, we're making persons feel that it is. That. We're singling them out and making them feel that it is. So, for, as a, a voting member, born and raised uh, Virgin Islander and a member of the voting electorate, I see both sides of it. But I want us to consider, and particularly the decision makers and lawmakers of this territory, understand that decisions of such need thought provoking processes, and you have to look at the ramifications that you're putting persons in. Our viewers still ahead, uh, Dr. Natalia Wheatley has been appointed as the official deputy premier of the British Virgin Islands, and we have all the details, so stick with us. Father Jesus, that learn you along like church service. Hmm. Customer line, please. Wait, hold on a second. Yes, Sonny Boy, come. Yes, Sonny Boy. Good morning, Sonny Boy. You must have cut fun tapping. It's okay, it's okay. I'll take care of it. What? No, no man, protect me. How may I assist you? Yes, yes. yes. You want top of power? Eh? You want top of power? Eh? You want top of power? Huh? Join the prepaid party with CCT and enjoy more affordable data plans, more top up promotions, more savings with hero bundles, and more value for your money each and every Tuesday with Top Up Turn Up Tuesday. Visit a CCT store today or anywhere CCT Top Up is sold and top up your phone. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. You want top of power? Viewers, welcome back to 284 News. Now, some great news for the British Virgin Islands. The Minister of Education, Culture, Youth Affairs, Fisheries and Agriculture, Dr. the Honorable Natalia Whitley, has been sworn in as the official Deputy Premier of the British Virgin Islands. This happened earlier today around 5 p.m. at the Sticket in the East End. Now, viewers, he will serve within this position until the next election season. Now, this follows an 18-month process that saw the minister carrying the responsibility, uh, the various ministers, that is, carrying the responsibility of Deputy Premier for three-month intervals. Now, upon taking up office, Premier Foy said, and I quote, we have ministers with great ability and great potential, and we want to make sure that government is involved in capacity building. Every three months for the first year, each minister will be given the opportunity to serve in the office of Deputy Premier, end of quote. Now, Premier Foy said that the temporary appointments would allow for each minister to get the necessary experience, an experience uh, that they need to develop in uh, certain levels of government and areas of government. And after that year, someone will be permanently uh, uh, appointed to that post. So today, that time has come. Uh, initially, the Premier of the Virgin Islands, Ron, he did say one year after we saw, of course, the rotation of all five ministers. Uh, but today, is was it five or four? four it of the was uh, four of the cabinet members. Right, yes. four of the ministers rotating. Uh, but today, 18 months after, we see the Premier of the Virgin Islands as well uh, in, in collaboration with the Governor of the Virgin Islands um, coming together to appoint Dr. Natalia Whitley. And when we think about uh, Mr. Whitley, we, you know, we've seen him carry the portfolios of several ministries uh, under his, uh, under his, uh, uh, his portfolio in government. Um, so many already. Uh, aside from that, he has also served in the community as an educator for many, many years. Um, also as an advocate, a voice of reason in the community. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, he was even elected. Uh, and that is because of his advocacy and his voice in the community. Um, so we know for sure that um, also, I, I would like to add that I, I think he is very teachable. And I think the premier values those qualities. And here we see him being appointed as the deputy premier for, I guess, the next 
two years, two and a half uh, years? Two and a half, almost three years. Jovan, we're very, uh, uh, we, we would like to say congratulations to the Honorable Minister. To be honest with you, I think uh, while the Premier's uh, uh, take on the reshuffling was cool, um, and he wanted to give everyone an experience, I think all Virgin Islanders are happy that we're no longer playing musical chairs, yes. and we do have a confirmed person in the post of Deputy Prayer. So we wish him all the best, viewers. That's all the time we have. I'm Ron Grant. And I am Javon Wilson. Thank you so much, viewers, for joining us. Happy Friday, guys. Bye-bye.